Okay, so we're going to start getting started here. I'm Derek Samaras. I'm from Chicago. I'm part of the Yaya's, the Youth and Young Adults. I'm really thankful for this opportunity to be with such amazing minds and beautiful people and wonderful spirits. So thank you. And I invite you to share this experience with me as we're constantly learning in this huge school, right? So my presentation is on the attractive personality of Jesus. I fully believe from my experience, my own personal experience, that there was a pattern formulated by Jesus and how we can interact with each other and how we can really strengthen our social ministry. Okay? And uh, if the goal of any of our social ministries is to really reveal the Father to somebody else and let them know that God is within them. right? So how can we do that in a modern society and culture that is permeated with all sorts of materialistic distractions. How can we bring that Jesusonian love into everyday interactions, okay? And what I'm going to talk on is a little bit more methodical and more material, but it's knowing that I have confidence in all of you that you can bring the spirit of Jesus into it, and I'll show you how to do it so that it's not just robotic behaviors. This is real intimate encounters with each other, okay? That being said, I want to just pay attention to Jesus that's gained and he was the master teacher, and his attractive personality is what he's displayed with gained. We all can learn a ton from, and I'm going to touch on it a little bit. So, first thing that I want to get, uh, <laughs> topic that I want to get covered here is the concept between hero and leader. Right now in society, we're in a kind of tumultuous state where you look at the rise of maybe certain politicians, let's say Trump or someone might say he wants to rise and be a hero and make America great again, right? You see a lot of people stepping up and thinking that a leader is someone who's going to save everyone. But we need to understand a hero is only possible when there's an impending cataclysmic event some dooming event that somebody needs to step up and save someone from, right? But that's a very temporary action. When a real leader has sustainable qualities that allow us to grow sustainably forever, equally, okay? So that's why I want you to really pay attention that there will be a lot of heroes that pop up under the guise of being leaders, but it's really the Jesus, the family man, the man who's invested in your spiritual development and, and has the respect for your space, for you to grow and go within and find the Father, those are our leaders. Those are the ones we want to celebrate. And so we can, if we can adopt some of those characteristics and techniques, it's going to help tons with our social ministry. So here we are. Here's Jesus. And a lot of paintings of Jesus, they have him as this very meek, you know, um, humble, gentle, soft-spoken, quiet man. Right? And what we learned from the Urantia book is he was vigorous. Right? I mean, how are you going to get these strong, robust fishermen of Galilee to call you master? Right? Without him saying, I'm a hero, without him swearing, without him beating someone up or displaying some huge, powerful display. Right? And we, as we remember from reading the Urantia book, it was his own Hebrew brethren that wouldn't accept him because he wasn't choosing to give this huge Moses display of power. They wanted this powerful king, and he brought truth. He brought peace. Okay? And he is the master leader. So remember that when we invoke the spirit of truth within us, and we bring out the teacher of Jesus within us, it's going to be unique for all of us. That's the beauty of it. We all have this, and it updates with each generation within us. So we are this revelation of truth with Jesus working with us, okay? So as we go in and we talk to Jesus, we'll start to portray leadership qualities. Okay? Now this is really important, oh, this concept. Right. Maybe you've seen this meme online before, maybe you haven't. But the concept between the leader, leading the line, he's bleeding with his people, right? He's sweating, he's working with his people, him or her, regardless. I'm a man, sometimes I say men, Things, but don't hold it against me, I'm sorry. <laughs> Versus a boss, right? And the boss isn't willing to get his hands dirty. 
But we know when you get your hands dirty, that's when you're experiencing things and that's when you're growing. You think of like lifting weights. It's not a pleasurable experience when you're lifting something very heavy, but the results <coughs> grow. You get stronger, you have more discipline, you like the way you look, you feel healthier, other people are attracted to you, all because you went through that little struggle, that little pain, right? So I'm kind of inviting you guys to get out of your comfort zones and realize that if we're really going to make effective change on this planet, we're going to have to step into new realms. Okay? We can't stay isolated. And, you, and we can convince ourselves that we're not isolated, but we can stay in our own circles and be isolated within that. Way. So here we are. These are our leaders, right? These are our, right? our politicians. This is where we're going to look to is to lead us. <laughs> But this is what we really want. When the power of love overcomes the love of power, the world will know peace. Jimi Hendrix, your entry creator. Okay. So it's this love that's inspiring us to really bring peace. It's not the power. It's the power of love. And we inspire that in each other. And today, I'm going to try to teach you techniques that you can use in every interaction that can hopefully enable you to inspire that power of love in each other. To get that other person to go inward and to find God. Because that's where God's waiting for us all. And it was Jesus who told his apostles when you're talking to other men and you're telling them about the kingdom of God, the first thing you tell them is by any means, find God within. Go inside and find God. Okay? And the second thing he said was be righteous. And I really think that he had the foresight to know, to tell them to do whatever they had to do to go inside and find God, because he knew he was sending his spirit of truth, and he was going to be there to meet them. So when he tells them to tell other men, and when you tell other people to do whatever you have to do to go inside and find the Father within, Jesus will meet them there, and together they will find the Father. It's beautiful. We just send them there. Send them on their way, and let the spirit of truth do the work with them. So I want to read a little bit about the description of Jesus. And this is when he was young. I'll just read it out loud. His eye was kind but searching. His smile was always engaging and reassuring. His voice was musical but authoritative. His greeting cordial but unaffected. Always even the most commonplace of contacts, there seemed to be evidence, the touch of a twofold nature, the human and the divine. <coughs> Ever he displayed this combination of the sympathizing friend and the authoritative teacher. And these personality traits began early to become manifest even in his adolescent years. So I really want you to pay attention to the dual nature of all these things. Kind, but searching. Musical, but authoritative. Cordial, but unaffected. Sympathizing friend, authoritative teacher. There's this duality, okay? And why it's so attractive to the human mind is when your mind gets stretched into dualities, there's growth. There's space for growth there. You look at comedians, they'll take something that's very commonplace and recognizable, and they'll put it in something that's in a ridiculous light. You know, like uh, flying dinosaurs with lasers on their head or something like that. Right? You don't, you don't picture dinosaurs like that. But you put it in a light that stretches your mind. And in that stretch, it's like stretching your muscles with lifting weights. There's going to be growth in there. We're getting out of our comfort zones. That's the important thing. He knew how to stretch people's comfort zones so they could step into new territory and affect growth, really. So here's some more about him when he was growing up. He possessed a healthy and well-proportioned body, a keen and analytical mind, a kind and sympathetic disposition, a somewhat fluctuating but aggressive temperament, all of which were becoming organized into a strong, striking, and attractive personality. He was a leader of men, a rough men. At that time, he is becoming expert in the divine art of revealing his paradise father to all ages and stages of mortal creatures. So even at a young age, he was feeling this. And he was literally in love with people. He wanted to see them grow to their fullest potential at a very young age. But it's not like he was this weak little passive guy who was very meek saying, I want you to grow. How are you going to get the attention of a rugged fisherman if you're like that, right? 
He had presence. He walked in the room, you knew he walked into the room. He wasn't demanding people to listen to him. He had so much value that you wanted to listen to him. So I really want to share with you what it is that creates value. And value is the name of the game. Okay? Unfortunately, right now in our materialistic society, we see value on the outside. If you're good looking, if you have money, if you have a nice car, a nice job, whatever, then you have some sort of status and authority, and then you can contribute to society, right? But what I'm saying, what Jesus was saying, is that you all already innately have value within you. You just need the quality of life that allows the space for self-knowledge. You need to know your gifts, okay? And if you don't have the opportunity to learn that, you're not going to know what your gift is and how you can then contribute to the society. We can all contribute to this society. We need the quality of life that allows us to self-knowledge. And it needs to be equal for all of us. Okay? So more on the talk of how kind of rugged he was. I mean, he was a nomad, right? He was a strong fisherman, a leader. He packed all those camels for his caravan. He went on a few caravans. He went homelessly wandering, right? I'm sure the man had calluses. I'm sure the man had scars, right? He was not this beautiful, pretty little thing who wears lotion gloves at night. Lotion gloves. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was tough but kind. He was rough but friendly, you know? He was authoritative but very compassionate. And that's what I'd like to invite you to take on this dual fold. We always say I'm right brain, I'm left brain, I'm right handed, I'm left handed. But challenge yourself. Be bold. He did it. And he's inviting us to do it. And that's how we grow. We go into those unknown places. So, with all those wonderful traits that he had, he was obviously very attractive to you. Okay? And here's Rebecca. Poor Rebecca. Oh, <laughs> she, she, she loved him. She wanted to marry him, but... Jesus told him, look, if I am a son of destiny, told her, if I am a son of destiny, I must not assume obligations of lifelong duration until such a time as my destiny shall be made manifest. So he, she, he was basically telling her, look, this isn't for me, this is what I gotta do. Which probably made him even more attractive to her. <laughs> yeah. Hard to get The hard to get him. But you understand that part of his motivation is salvation for others. And right now, we're getting caught in sex with others. Okay? And I know this is going to get a little real, but this is something that's really happening out there, is that this influence of sexual relations immediately, and especially speaking from a man, we get bombarded with sexual imagery constantly, especially in America. Okay? So what that does is then, it makes every interaction with the opposite sex almost objectified. So we go with what's stuck in our subconscious from all the visual programming we've seen. And then if we don't know how to interact with the opposite sex or anyone really, we're going to go with what we've been trained in our subconscious. And that's what's going to dump into our interactions. So you're going to see, let's say you go to any kind of social event, what you might see is almost like grade school where you're going to have men on one side and women on the other side and some of the men are going to be too frozen and go and talk to the women because they don't know how to engage that interaction and they're only stuck in their comfort zone which is watching their TV that's telling them that women are sex objects. Okay? Don't hold it totally against us, not all of us are that way. Okay? But I'm trying to teach some skills that can kind of break that. Okay? So I really feel that a lot of this confusion of um, gender issues in our communication is from the Adam and Eve <coughs> debacle. Um, you see the interpretation of how it, the tree of life is brought into Judaism, um, Christianity, and it's even become this concept, like this metaphor for sexual alchemy. Um, I know in a lot of uh, Judaic scripture, they talk about it being the tree of life, the tree of knowledge, 
um, finding God within is this kind of um, sexual alchemy of holding off um, orgasm allows you to then maintain your contact with God. I know the Taoist priests live by that too. They hold off their ejaculation because they feel that's what keeps them grounded in talking to God. It's, it's kind of unique. But we understand what the tree of life was about. We understand what Adam and Eve were here for. They were biological uplifters and during agriculture. And the whole phone tag that came out of the confusion of that has kind of put us where we are right now, where we're so separated. We lost our opportunity to see men and women rule equally. We lost it. It's gone. We haven't seen it again. Right? So what example did we have? We had Jesus who said, empower women. They are teachers. They're equals. Empower them. But they missed it. Right? They didn't really do that. The apostles did not empower women. They were maybe too scared, too afraid. They didn't know how to talk to women. Whatever it was. Okay? One thing I, I do want to mention, and I, and I would venture to guess that the apostles suffered from this, is, um, this is just another uh, version of what some people have interpreted the truth of life. You know? It gets kind of wacky. <laughs> it gets kind of wacky. It can be a little offensive too, you know, in the revelation. But here's the thing. All right, so now I'm gonna get really real with you guys. This guy right here, Neil Strauss, who's a total and we call nerd, complete nerd, right? He was a writer for the Rolling Stone, but he was completely like um, unable to communicate with women. He was incredibly intimidated, and so he took it upon himself to kind of infiltrate an underground network, a community of other ex-nerds who have decided to handle this. Like, you know what? I want to learn how to con how to counteract this problem that I have. And I'm willing to learn. And I want to be able to communicate with women. Some of them want to communicate with women so they could get a girlfriend. Some of them so they could have sex. Some of them so they could have power, right? But from my observation, what I've seen, what these guys have come up with, is that it hints just a little bit at what Jesus was doing. And when you start to hint at what Jesus was doing, there's going to be attraction. It's just inevitable. Michael is the sovereign of this, of this universe, and this planet starts and ends with him. Everything Jesus does is perfect, right? It's going to be attractive. So if you do 5% do of Jesus' characteristics, you're going to be really attractive. But you need to know how to navigate through those waters so it just doesn't turn into this like sexual thing all the time. We want God. We want salvation. Right? So this guy, he wanted a girlfriend, at least something, right? So he found this guy, Mystery. Now Mystery was another nerd, but he turned magician. And what he found he found that in order for me to engage others, I need to display a high level of value in order to get their attraction. <coughs> okay, so we all have a little bit of value in us, like I told you. But what he would do is not what Jesus would do. But what he would do is he would have these grand displays. He would do a trick in front of somebody. He would do something clever and witty. And so that some people would become intrigued with him. Okay? Now Jesus... He had such value, he could look you in the eye, and you knew this man is a leader, and you wanted to listen to him. Not everyone has that, so it's almost this fake it till you make it concept, right? And so a lot of people will just, ah, look at me, I'm so valuable, I'm so valuable, I'm so valuable. But as we know, a rich man doesn't have to tell you he's rich, right? He just walks in and he knows he's rich. He doesn't have to tell you for you to love him and to know he's rich. So what I want to do is really bring up ways that we can, this is part of like the thing, is that's how far we are from our communication with men and women. And I want to address it. I want to make it healthy again. Okay? I want us to be equals. I want us to grow and respect one another. And I don't want it to be this, this form of how men are now making money of teaching men how to seduce women. Because the real seduction is finding God. Let God seduce you, right? That's what we really want. But what I want to do is then say that in this attraction formula, you can turn it into not getting a girlfriend, you 
can if you want, but you can turn it into effective social ministry. Real change, real connection. Okay? So it's broken down into three parts. This is what they looked at. Okay? They had the attraction, the comfort, and the seduction. In the attraction, it starts with an opener. And this is for every interaction in your life, it's going to be an opener. You have to start it. You have to say hi. You have to say hello. You have to say look at that. Or say, whoops, my bad. Whatever it is, you have to engage. That's my line. <laughs> really, you have to engage, whether it's hi, hello, whatever it is. Okay? Now from there, you have to display your value and gain attraction. And I know this sounds a little methodical and not like spiritual or everything, but think about it if you're driving down the highway, you got to use a car. Same thing, when we're talking in social dynamics, let's just give this model a, a, a test. Okay? So display value. Um, if you look at what's valuable, all right, right now I'm probably the most valuable person in the room because all of your eyes are on me. I am leading the discussion, right? It doesn't mean I'm better than any of you. It just means at this particular moment, I have the most value in the room, and hence I have influence. And I'm the leader of this room right now because you guys are listening to me, and I hold your influence. So what we understand then is all of us, at one point, have been leaders or are leaders, because when we're in interaction and we have the value, we have the attention, we now are leaders. We hold influence now. So we need to be responsible with that. Otherwise, if we don't understand our role in this dynamic, we're going to take it off a cliff, or we're not going to have effective ministry within it. Okay? So we need to understand our role and our positions when we're a leader. So we, do, we, we open, we display value, all right? And we gain this type of attraction. But now, in order to make effective connection, we need to elicit value from our audience. Okay? What that might look like is, remember how Jesus always spoke to the highest, highest side of someone, their potential, right? It's really important to bring out people's passions. It's, that's like the number one thing you can do, is bring out someone's passions. So when you ask somebody, what, what are you passionate about? and they tell you. That's what you want to speak to. You want to put them in the place where they're passionate. Let me ask, what are you passionate about? Loving God. Loving God. Okay, so when you are loving God, what 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 what, what, what do you feel? What goes through your mind when you're, when you're loving God? Passion, desire to serve. So serve. Wanting to know more people. Love That's beautiful, right? We're all one big family. And you, you have a genuine heart that you do want to serve. Yeah, I can help. That's wonderful. And it's inspiring. I encourage you to do it more. And however I can help, I will. <laughs> so, okay. So, so you see this. It's, we're speaking to what their goals are, their passion, right? And we want to help them build on that. And that's what we're attracted to. That's what Jesus was attracted to. He was attracted to their higher side, their potential. So we want to help them get to their potential. So when we do that, we basically have a reason to be attracted to them. Okay? I asked you what your passion was. I'm attracted to your passion because it is attractive. Now there's a mutual attraction. Okay? But that doesn't mean that now we're just going to have a beneficial relationship that's going to last for years. Once you have attraction, that's just right here. That's fleeting. It's not going to last. It's not grounded. We need to go into comfort. We need trust. We need comfort. And we need rapport between each other. Right? I mean, you're not gonna you're not gonna just jump in a car with someone you just met before, until you trust them. And part of that trust and comfort and rapport, one of the techniques that I used, that Jesus used, was storytelling. Within storytelling, you can embed so much of your character and values without directly telling someone. So let's say um, I just say you know. Oh, last night, it was like 3 in the morning, and my sister called me. She was like 50 miles away. Her car broke down, so I drove down there to pick her up. And, you know, I drove her back home, and I felt bad, so I, I made her, you know, this, this chicken that I really loved to make. It was really good. She loved it. And it was great, and I, I, was, I was happy I could help. Okay, so within that story, I told you that I'm loyal to my family. I'm willing to go out and save someone that I care about. I can cook. Right? that I care about the women in my life. 
stuff like that, that I'm brave for them. Right? But I didn't tell you, I said, hey, look how brave I am. Check out my car, right? Pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so it's this like real, realness. That's like, like when you see that picture of Jesus with the baby on his shoulders and he's holding that other girl's hand and they're just walking down the beach, like, that's beautiful. And there's something in that that is attractive, you know, whatever it hints at. And I know I grew up with just my mom and my sister, so I, I speak partial womanese. <laughs> and, the, and, and the concept of seeing a loving father is like one of the most attractive things a woman, a woman can see. You know? So it, it's really important what we see is valuable and what is fleeting. So we really want to ground this value, this trust, comfort, and rapport, so we can trust each other. We want to bring stories out of them and experiences so it feels like we went on an adventure together. We trust each other more. When we have these workshops or retreats, and we get to know each other, how much closer are our bonds now? We, look, we look, really look forward to seeing each other the next year or whatnot. But if we just say hi, hi, and we move on, there's no strength in that. We need to develop strength. So that they can trust that their spirit's in good hands. If you look at it, let, let's say it's a, a dating scenario, right? And you guys are totally attracted to each other, and you want to get intimate, there needs to be trust there, right? <laughs> It's the same thing. What's more intimate than finding God within? You need to trust you. He's guiding you. And it's really important. And if you have that leadership role, you need to have integrity with how you're doing it. Right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be real easy where you might display Jesus' own qualities, and then all of a sudden the person who you're talking to just go, I want you, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm more of you mm -hmm. because you're being so attractive. Because they don't know about Jesus. They don't know about God even. Who knows? The average person is very secular. So they could fall into the sexual attraction. And now it's up to you to be kind of like when um, Jesus was dealing with, uh, sorry, the woman at the well, Nalda. Mm -hmm. And uh, he just came in with his normal confidence. He said, I need a drink, right? And she started to think, like, man, this guy's taking on. All right, he's attractive, cool, I'll go with it. And uh, he stopped right then. And he's just like, no, woman, go bring your husband. And it wasn't this power play. He wasn't like, ha ha, get your husband. Ah, ha, you wish you could have him. <laughs> he was really like, no, I'm not messing around with this sex world. My goal is salvation. Mm -hmm. It's there. This water that I'm providing, you will never thirst again. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's what, hopefully, ideally, as we get to know ourselves, we can find that water that we're providing, and we can share it. That's the real goal here, is to share. Or is it knowledge is possessed only by real sharing and safeguarded through wisdom and socialized with love? Yeah. Okay. So, talk about value. And now, as a full-grown man, an adult of the realm, he prepares to continue his supreme mission of revealing God to men and leading men to God. Behold the man. So, this is the man. This is the value. Jesus has the most value than anyone we know. What his value holds is something called social proof, okay? Social proof is when your reputation precedes you in many people. So when, let's say, a celebrity shows up and gives a speech, there's going to be a lot of people come out, right? They don't, they're not going to ask who it is because they're already famous. There's already enough people who are his hype man. Right? So people are attracted to what three things. Or at least they'll be looking at three things. One, what other people are looking at. Two, bright and shiny things. Right? <laughs> and three, sorry. And three, that which like calls to our own inner program of what we find attractive. So like you can do a test and you can just go stand on the corner and just look up in the sky. And then other people walk by and they'll like look up too. <laughs> and then everyone will be like looking up and they don't even know what we're looking at. But you're just looking up because the eye will always go where other people are looking. So if I have a whole room looking at me and one person walks by, they're like, wow, everyone's looking at that person. They must be really important. Right? Jesus, man, he made a name for himself. So when he walked around, his reputation preceded him. And so he had ultimate value. He'd walk in the room and people would listen. Hence, behold the man. Whoops. Okay, so I've taken their formula and I'm making it more into a salvation <coughs> formula. And, that, 
and this is stuff that you can apply to your social ministry right away. Um, we're basically starting with attraction, as I told you. The whole goal is to display your value and elicit value. Now, part of displaying your value is you need to know who you are. Okay? You need to be grounded in your identity. And if you're not grounded in your identity, the other person will pick that up and find out that you're just a little fickle, you're a little flighty, and I can't really count on you. Because you don't even know you. How do you expect me to tell you who you are? Right? So that's really important. So what I encourage all of you to do is find what your talents are, find what makes you you, and really ground it in you in ways that you can tell a story about it. In a way that's valuable. If it's boring, make it exciting. Okay? You want to have this identity that is truly you, it's a high version of you, and it's, an insp it's inspiring. Okay? It's something that when someone asks what you do, or who are you, if you have a boring answer, then you better make something up that's funny. And, and it really, it's like, if you can't come up with anything else, like, I'm a milk delivery guy or something like that, it's fine, whatever, but that might not be that exciting, you can always crack a joke. You can always go, I'm a plus size butt model, or something like that. Like, you can say something that can break the tension of you, of you being disappointed with what you are, or who you are, or what you're doing. Because you cracking that joke, that's at least displaying more value. I was just going to say, you brought up a very interesting subject. I was at a group once in college, and people came over because I was with the ambassador. They said, who are you? And I said, nobody. And they couldn't believe it. They were bowing to me and shaking my They thought I must be somebody because I was with an important person. Yeah. Our relationship, he was just a person. We talked about his family and his kids, but the idea that who you're with, they didn't believe me. They said, could I sit next to you? Could, yeah. could I have your telephone number? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's more that, that's more social proof. Isn't that's that, that is. crazy? Yeah, I mean, look, look, I could be the biggest uh, or the most unattractive person standing in the middle of a huge party and no one's looking at me. And all it takes is the most attractive girl there or one of them to come by. Just be like, oh, hey, Derek. And everyone who views that is like, whoa. That person who's really attractive is attracted to that person. Maybe I should be attracted to that person. Right? <laughs> Jesus walks by and he's got like hundreds of followers with him. Walks into a new town. Goes, Whoa, look at all those people following this guy. I want to listen to this guy. What has he got to say? He's got to have something to say. Now, again, I'm not saying that you need to be rich. You need to have some exciting lifestyle or anything like that. Remember, I'm just showing material right now. When we enthuse the spirit of Jesus into this, it transcends these material values. People can pick up on your value if you're bright with Jesus inside that spirit of truth and of God, they'll just sense it. I don't know if you guys have felt this when we're in like spiritual retreats, or I just came from a spiritual family reunion in LA with Pata Bantan, and I got charged, man, spiritually just charged, to the point where I was at the, the airport going back to Chicago, and people were approaching me because, I don't know, they were just attracted to that vibe that I had in me from this spiritual love that was emanating. It's like ripples that flow out. If people sense it, they're like, I want some of that. Can you teach me? Can you lead me to heaven? The problem is with our modern culture, we stop at sex and we think that it's sex that they want. But I'm saying we need to go a step further into salvation. Okay? So, obviously, with comfort, we have our trust and rapport. We can develop ways of having people being more familiar with us, stories, um, opening up, um, just experiences with each other. Okay? So I want you to start to think about it in three ways, in three sections. You have your attraction time, where you display your value, and then you elicit their value, like Jesus would do, and then you spoke to their high values. Okay? In a sense, you're attracted to their values. So now there's mutual attraction. And then you're into the comfort space, where you tell your stories, where you have experiences with one another, you play little games, you do little fun things, you um, imagine little scenarios with each other, go on trips, whatever it is, that you can start to be comfortable with each other, enough to trust that someone, when they tell you to go within and find God, that you believe them. And they believe you, and you tell them. Okay? It's not, it's going to be difficult, because people who are not your readers and, God, and do not know Jesus are going to be so secular that they think 
as did the fertility cults all over this world in history, think that reproduction is the highest expression of community. And you're going to have to work past that. Now, if you want to get a girlfriend or a husband or whatever, fine, you can stay there. And you, you can be respectful in that manner, as long as you're respectful in that manner. But if you want to go further and really help someone find God within, then let's take it to the salvation. Get enough trust, get enough rapport and comfort with someone, that they will believe you when you tell them to go inside and find the Father. Okay. So this is going back to the woman at the well. And it's really just talking on the same thing that when you do have this value and this confidence, notice how Jesus never said, I'm a great man, give me water. He just said, you know, give, give me some water, I want to drink. And that alone in his tonality, as we, just, as we talked about, his tonality, his voice, his body, his sense of presence, his body language obviously was probably very powerful. That was enough value. That was enough for her to be intrigued somewhat or to think that he was flirting with her. And even in her mind, it went to the sexual accordion. It wasn't, oh, there might be potential salvation here. So I would really like to think that of all my interactions is potential salvation. Mm -hmm. It's a potential spirit growth. Thought adjusters want to commune. I tell myself, while I'm talking to someone, I say, thought adjuster, I want you to communicate with their thought adjuster. Okay? And that mentally puts me in the state where I'm grounded in salvation. All right? And I'm thinking with this head, not the other. Um, okay, so one of the things that Jesus would do, though, is he kept women as equals and empowered them to be teachers and leaders. And that's something that, you know, I'm very passionate about. This um, equality in spirits and in being a leader. On the morrow, we will set apart ten women for the ministering work of the kingdom. Obviously, the apostles missed the ball on this one. And we're kind of reeling from it ever since. But um, we need to understand the dynamics between men and women are broken. And it's, I put a lot of the responsibility on the man to fix it. And where that responsibility lies is on each individual man to go inward. And we need to have reconciliation with our feminine side. We need to be in touch with our emotions. I feel that it's really important if we can go inside and kind of alchemize with this trauma that we have with modern society, with competition, with ego. Ego's important, but we can't let it run us. Right? And the more that we go inside and get right with our inner world, the more that we have harmony on the outside. And it reflects as within, so without, right? Spirit trumps all. If you work on your spirit, the material will take care of itself. So when we go in and we work on our spirit, that starts to ripple out, and people can trust you. They will be attracted to you, and you can trust yourself. You will be responsible with the sanctity of each person's space. It's very important, okay? It's, it goes beyond respect women. Okay, but how do I respect women? No. Understand who you are fully, and then you will respect everyone, because you appreciate that that power that you have within you they also have. And how can I help them glorify that power even more? Okay? Also, Jesus and his wonderful relationship with children. It was customary for one or two of the smallest of the children to climb upon his knees and sit there, looking up in wonderment at his expressive features as he told his stories. The children loved Jesus, and Jesus loved the children. So you know how Jesus talks about us being children of God and how we have to be children? And that James Woodward gave a, a presentation about true worship is play. We're playful beings. We're here to play and learn. Okay? So the more playful, the more joyful we are, the more valuable, the more attractive we are. We actually bring value into a room when we come in with a good attitude. Right? You, you come in and you're just like, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to put it like this. James Bond never makes friends because he's always in the corner looking cool, right? You might be cool, but James Bond is not going to make friends. A friendly guy will, okay? Yes? Um, what you just said when he stayed, Jesus walked into the room and reminded me of the Last Supper. And he 
came in, the apostles were all arguing amongst themselves on where they were going to sit. So he came in, and all he did was give him his unique smile. It really eased the tension. Yeah, and, and it started washing feet. Like, talk about blowing people away. Kind of everyone's arguing, and he goes, and he's like, I'm going to wash you. Mm -hmm. And then those are those statements that shock people. This love that Jesus would give, it would literally shock people, his love. And you'd be like, whoa, I can't believe someone loved me like that. And then when you invoke Jesus in your life and the spirit of truth comes through you, and you start thinking such nice things, and you do something that's so selfless, you're like, I can't believe I did that. It's something else. It's like Jesus is mine coming in there, right? It's shocking. It literally is shocking. That love shocks us to the core to where tears come down our eyes, right? I mean, I cry all the time just thinking about Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> but it, well, I want you to also recognize the, the attractive qualities of a man who values children. How important that is, okay? Not only because it's our future, not only because we want to have good families, but what did Jesus say? That what you do to the least of my brethren, you also do to me. Mm -hmm. And watch out for these little kids because there's angels who are watching out for them too. So it's a really important thing as far as being good. Now Jesus even would kind of step into areas that were rather uncomfortable. Like it was pretty, I mean, he expected these women, let me read this. You will forgive us for coming at this hour, but Canaan and I desire a bite to eat. And we would share it with these of our newfound friends who are also in need of nourishment. We come to you with the thought that you will be interested in counseling with us as to the best way to help these women to get a start, a new, life, a new start in life. So he really picked up these women who are kind of downtrodden. And he shows up in his new friend's house and is like, hey, I know it's late, but can you make us food and like help these people's lives? <laughs> Not a small that's thing. A, yeah. <laughs> that's a lot. That's like imposing almost. But he knew. He had that confidence when he walked in. He's like, this isn't out of their comfort zone. This will happen. I think this is the right thing to do. I don't know if it's anything I would do. I, that's a pretty ballsy move. I don't think I can do that. But he's a master son, so. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And if you think about that, I mean, here were two women who were pretty much sex workers at the time. And it didn't matter to him. He saw the value in that, right? And then, supreme artist, he took something that he was attracted to to them, to their salvation, and he networked it with another one that he brought salvation to. Now that's real value. That's when you take one person and you connect them with a bigger network, and you make the value that much bigger. And the whole goal is that's what we're going to do for the whole world, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing. We're networking for Jesus. That's what we're doing. So real artists. They have a huge following because they've networked so many people. You look at someone like the Dalai Lama, someone like that who has a huge following. But then you look at someone like, you know, militant dictators who have huge following. And that's kind of a fear-based mm, value, yeah. right? They kind of like threaten them into following through this raw power, not this respect and admiration. So this brings me into this concept of personal religion. I think is really important because we're all living our personal religion, and that's really what displays this attractive qualities of how we internalize the revelation and Jesus' teachings, and then how we display it. That's our personal religion. It's not so much that man is conscious of God, it's that man yearns for God, the results in the universe essential. So everyone's yearning for him, right? We need to bring that out. Part of your personal religion is this growth of your personal religion. And it, 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 it's metaphors for everything in the Trinity, really, but it starts with this thought. You know, thought comes up, right? And then we express it. And then we have realization from that thought that we make. Right? From that action, we learn from our own action. And other people learn from that action. And then from that, we go right back into the cycle and develop it again. And it starts to grow. And that's really what's becoming our religion. This personal religion starts with this revelation. And hopefully if you do this attractive model properly, you will spark revelation in each other. Because that's really what it comes from. 
All the people who really are founded in God and believe in God have had such a palpable, tangible experience that there's no going back. No. Right? This is too real. I can't deny that. This is real. And I'm changing because of it. I'm becoming a better person because of it. So with Revelation, we have personal, we have ethical, but in a sense, it's really the personal relationship with God and how we gain inspiration from that relationship in order to take it out into reality. And that becomes our philosophy to obviously knowledge plus experience is wisdom. We have to get out and get our hands dirty. We can't stay isolated in our safe spiritual communities that we all agree with each other. We have to take that value that we've learned and go out. We have to venture out. Okay? If you look at it like that guy Neil Strauss or Mystery that I was talking about, they consider themselves pickup artists. Mm -hmm. Okay? But I would like to consider ourselves pickup artists for God. We're picking people up. If they're low hanging fruit, let's pick them up. Right? We're going out and we're re recruiting agents in the kingdom of heaven. Like, that's powerful stuff. Have pride in that. Okay? And put yourself in unknown places because just like lifting those weights, you're going to grow. And now I'm giving you techniques on how to lift those weights properly. Okay? Now, in our service, obviously we make our choices, decisions, actions, expression, creativity. That's how we choose to express our religion. I'm challenging you to go out into new places to express that. This is from Stuart. Do you recognize this? I do. <laughs> Many souls can best be led to love the unseen God by being first taught to love their brethren whom they can see. So we look at this like this flow of the dynamics of love, and obviously it all comes from the Father, and we want to get people back there. We want to get people tapped into that constant flow. And as we were talking, as you were talking, this faucet technique, that true love, it's, it expands by sharing. You're never going to hold on to it. If you hold on to it, you break that circuit, the strength of that love diminishes. I'll give you a quick story. I, do, I, I train in martial arts. Um, when I was young, I was training in Taekwondo. And the teacher, the instructor, told me he wanted to show a lesson. And he said, Derek, put out your arm and make a fist, and I'm going to try to push it down. So I made a fist. And he pushed it down rather easily. And then he said, okay, now keep your hand open, and I'm going to try to push it down. And he couldn't push it down. It was, like, very strong. And what he explained to me is that when we're open, we're connected to the circuits. There's more strength in this. When we close it off, it's weaker. So remember that. With God's love, the more that we share it, the stronger this network is. The more we hold this for ourselves, to fall away, all right? This is the strong foundation. We take our love from the Father through the thought of gesture into us, and as we share it with each other, there's a loop that goes around through the Supreme and through all other people in existence. It's a beautiful, sustainable ripple. So here's just another review on the method, right? I think it's... Um, really important that you start to fill in these categories for how they pertain to you. Okay? What is your value? What can you bring? What can you bring that might inspire someone else? What are you proud about? What are you passionate about? You need to understand these things, because these are all that make you. So you want to represent yourself fully. If that means hygiene you got to get taken care of, get it taken care of. If that means speech, get it taken care of. If that means your body mechanics, whatever it is, work on it. We're here to learn, right? So let's start working on these things. There's so many subtle things that can make an interaction go wrong. And until you have the experience in this, you're only going to be guessing. The experiential knowledge, the wisdom that comes from this, is something that will become second nature. You will know when someone trusts you and when they don't. You will know when someone's offended or think that you're being creepy. Right? And you'll know when to tone it down. If you come in and you're just, yeah, that's might be too much for someone. Right? If you could display internal value just above the north effort, the next time value. I think that all value starts from internal value. And if you know your internal value, you're, you're, or at least you feel your value, Whatever you say will be in, in, infused with that internal value. So 
So it is really important to go with the spirit first. <coughs> Attractions. Comes in the variety. Absolutely. And I think what's really important here is when you're engaging someone, there's three ways you can engage someone as far as tonality. And this is an important thing to know. You can either come into someone with rapport-seeking tonality, where the tonality will go up. I'll, I'll give you an, ex uh, an example by saying hello. Hello? Hello? Right? <laughs> so I'm kind of, my, my tonality goes up. I'm seeking this kind of acceptance before. That can be needy. It can come off as needy. Okay? Then there's the neutral. Hello? <laughs> right? Very neutral. And then there's the rapport breaking. Hello? <laughs> right? So you need to be really aware of where that other person is. Because if someone is like really down in the dumps and you come up with this high rapport seeking attitude, they're just gonna push you away. They're not, they don't want that. It's the same thing you're talking about, God is great, God is great, God is great, and they're not feeling it. <laughs> you're wasting your time, right? So you have to meet them where they're at. And what I say is like, if you're meeting someone, you should always go in neutral. Okay? Neutral. Unless they're at a very high level, then you want to go neutral to high. You always want to be at their level and then try to take it up a notch. Okay? Um, one of my examples is music. I used to be a DJ, and each song has a certain beats per minute. Mm -hmm. Okay? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And then when you bring in another song, you listen to the beats per minute on that song and you change it, you change the tempo until it's at the same beats per minute as the song that's playing. And then you bring it in and you have the beats match up. And they're the same, right? That's called a blend. So essentially what you're doing is you're blending with people. You find their BPM. And by the way, the heart BPM is 124 beats per minute, 124 beats per minute. You find their BPM and you meet them right on it. And now you guys are blending. Ideally, the better you get at this, the quicker you guys can blend. And then they trust you, and you're going to go on a musical adventure together. But the blends don't last forever. You have to bring in the next song. I think a lot of people will get stuck and so invested in, no, I have to make this work, I have to make this work, even though the song has passed. Okay? So know that things will move on. Nothing's permanent, really, except our spirit. What I want to do is I would like to get some advice from you guys, so that for my own personal growth, of what you find can be blockages between male and female when you're interacting. Okay? Is there anything that has been something that maybe you're stumbling on or something that's been a blockage when you're trying to communicate with the opposite sex? Um, Did you guys have? Well, I have some fundamental counseling background and so I always try to look people in the eyes when I speak to them. Men misinterpret this right away. Yeah. I think I'm really interested in something that I'm not. It's my first place is to go to where are you spiritually? What can we connect with there? And I'm not interested in you sexually. Yeah. So what I've tried to cultivate as a good listening tool can really quickly be misinterpreted. Absolutely. So, um I would say then the responsibility is on you. Mm -hmm. It always okay. is, right. So if you see the commonality, the common denominator is you're a close talker. I mean, I know you personally. Right. So I, I know how you are. You're right. a close talker. You like to get in their face. You like to eye contact. I'm really making <laughs> personal contact. Yeah. I mean, when I first met you, I, I want to know, know you. Yeah. you kiss me or not, but your husband's standing back. <laughs> <laughs> So, but regardless, so, I mean, we need to be aware of what we're doing. First. Right. So if we're going to lead... We have to go first. That's the important thing, is going first. You saw that, that image that I had of a leader and a boss. The leader was right in front. Jesus was in front. He blazed the path for us. So we have to go first. And if that means being, um, you're going to be revealing, then I'll be revealing first. You know, if it means being vulnerable, I'll be vulnerable first. If it means laugh, I will laugh first. But didn't Jesus always engage people by asking them a question? Absolutely. He didn't say hi, you know. He, he just said, oh, you look tired. How can I help you? Or something which he, he observed yes. about them. 
And he mm -hmm. talked to them on a level, not with ego, it was totally selfless. And he talked to their heart and their soul. And he, you're right, you have to know your audience, you have to know who you're speaking to. But perhaps because of my age, I deal with a lot of young men, and they really pay attention because maybe I'm like their grandmother. So I, and then they call me, and then they ask for my number. And then I end up teaching them parts of your algebra. And things just escalate, but it's gentle, and it's kind, mm -hmm. and it's truly sincere, because I am interested in that. Yeah, yeah. And that is the key. Forget yourself. You're, you're, Jesus didn't think of you. You're teaching us something. He didn't think about himself. He always thought about the person. He was speaking total attention to that person. Absolutely. And you see into their heart, and you, you just instinctively know. And, and, well, the thing is that... We, us as humans, we're not Jesus, right? So we can get caught up in this fantasy of Jesus asked questions. Okay, great, but how do I apply that into real life? Like you can just ask questions all day, and then pretty much you're just interviewing someone. Right. You're like, dude, I'm done with this. Right. I, I feel like I'm expending too much effort because you're asking so much of me. So we really need to be smart about how we ask questions and when and to who and how. One more thing is that you can tell the person of how they're going to respond. I know this is going to sound kind of secular, but from my experience, I found that most people respond in two ways when you're opening them. They're either a tester or an investor, okay? Now, a tester does not like direct attention. They would rather do the work, okay? So if you're going to engage a tester, you want to say something that's more observational in the environment. You're not directing your affection towards them. You're saying, hey, have you noticed that? Wow, that's crazy, that thing on the ground over there. That's wild, huh? And they're like, yeah. And then you start connecting on that way that's more not as obtrusive. But then there's some people who are investors, and they want to know that you have, they have your full attention, and you're the reason why they're attracted. So, excuse me, you just walked by. I thought you were really interesting looking, and I had to meet you. I'm Derek, right? So this direct attention. And you might just come in direct, and they'll be like, ugh. And then you're like, oh man, you're a tester, not an investor. Well, how about that over there? That's pretty funny, right? But so you can save yourself. And I'm not taking away the uniqueness of anyone by saying tester and investor. I'm just saying that we've been conditioned yeah, in certain audience. ways sure. that we respond to. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of techniques that you can Techniques are techniques. It has to come, as I'm sure what you're trying to, to communicate, from the reality of, of allowing God's love to flow through you and really wanting to know and love that person. Yeah. And so you can say, well, you know, Jesus asked questions. But that's not the point. The, the point is that he, he was really interested. Right. They were bound to him questions. The, the, the source yeah. of, of, of what you're doing is really that. Yeah. It has to come out of it. Yeah. The, the inner life. What, Stuart? I, I, I love the story, and we all love the stories of the Jesus papers, of Jesus when he meets the uh, lonely and forlorn young man on top of the hill, mm. and he feels compelled to find some way to bring this man out. So he goes to him and says, you seem to know these hills. Can you be of service to me? And tell me how to get, what is the best way to navigate these hills and get to this town? And the young man was now invited to give something of value to Jesus, which drew him out. And he became enthusiastic because he did know the hills. He knew the countryside. This was up his alley. And he had a chance to engage Jesus this way. And then Jesus said, there, he said, thank you so much. You know, sometimes I see you, and then he used that, you know, that sort of analogy to the young man about navigating the hills and, and struggles of life and, and offered him in return some sort of... And I just love that story because this young man, I don't think, would have been open to somebody just coming and inputting into their lives. Yeah. Absolutely. But to draw him out, so I think in a relationship, man to a woman or a woman to a man, yeah. you, it, it, it's a really good thing sometimes to find a positive way to draw them out with their energy for your need 
Absolutely, absolutely. And that's the eliciting value. So you want to elicit their value. He, I mean, he was a smart guy. He didn't even have to ask the question to know what their value was. But we do. So that's why I usually go with what you're passionate about or what did you want to be when you grew up when you were a kid, right? If you could be three animals, what would you be? Yes. Something like that, right? Something that's like non-threatening and just whatever they come up with, that's their value and invite them to share with you, to show you their skills and their talents. That's like, are there any more questions? What was your original question? Um, Obstacles. Blocks. About what? Blocks. Oh, yeah, blocks between men and women in communication. Well, one thing you touched on actually was um, yeah. more towards the beginning about uh, how we're programmed, for, and you were talking from a male perspective, yeah. but both okay. you know, men and women being programmed certain ways, and you were touching on objectification. Um, one thing that I have found, uh, I actually positively, that I, I, many men in my life are very aware of this and very, you know, philosophically we're on the same level, but in practice it's like, ugh, not always, I, and I don't know what I can do in my relationships with these people to help that, if there's anything I can do to empower or, you know, so for people to transcend those if I, if, all right so if I'm hearing you right uh, some of the people lack integrity integrity to walk with there's talking no it's not a hypocritical thing it's a I think just a genuine lack of knowledge and like I say it's really a mix of both of how to transcend that to reprogram things that maybe should, should not have be influencing us for media or, or yeah. whatever yeah um, you know, what I do is I go out into nature and I just try to unplug as much as I can. And I really start with my body. Like, you really, you know, say body, mind, spirit, stretch. Right? Get away from all that distraction, stretch. Get into that meditation. I know it's kind of cliche, but it really helps kind of refresh and recharge. When you pray, ask for God to refresh your spirit, recharge your mind as much as you can. I think for men, education does leaps and bounds with we can learn, we then acquire a new skill, and we feel all cool about it, and then we want to apply it right away. Um, we can talk more if you want to be more personal about personality types, um, and maybe we can find something that we can work on later come down and talk. If there's more of a specific question as to how can you encourage that other person to grow or to transcend the limitations of, of um, what they've been affected to, or what they're um, manipulated by, like as you said, how we are objectifying each other, then we need to be really conscious of what's coming in here, right? That's our willful power. We can willfully decide what's influencing us. So it takes that discipline to be the leader of yourself and to know what's coming in here. Yes? If I understood what the you asked, <coughs> well, I, I wasn't okay what I wanted to say then what you Sorry. said was true and the problem is that there is not much of that that's being discussed on the opposite publicly it's all this sexual attraction thing but what you're talking about here in a very uh, exclusive area it's not openly talked about so technically intellectually we may know about it but practically we lack some answers because it's so absent. Well, can I maybe give some insight into why it's so absent? Is that in our modern culture, it's almost expected that men come out of the womb knowing everything, <laughs> right? And and Who like. Who expects that? <laughs> I know. I don't think we think that. Yeah. Well, we all do. Men expect that on themselves. I know a lot of people will would rather lie and say that they know something instead of admitting that you know I have something to learn. And it's it's kind of almost pressed on us that in our circle of friends, I'm not talking about all of us, but in modern America, in their circle of friends, there's not a lot of affection being shared between men, all right? Mm -hmm. So they feel kind of emotionally isolated, and then the one sexual option is the woman, and they're now projecting all of that affection that they needed from their friends onto the woman. Now the woman has to play multiple roles, and that's not fair for her either, okay? So it starts with these men groups of being able to be comfortable with each other and be like, yo, dude, can you help me? 
how to talk to a woman or I feel vulnerable about this, whatever it is. Because the minute you say, I don't know how to talk to a woman, you get ridiculed for not knowing something, for not being the man. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate, but that's kind of the modern society we have. We even have a, an issue where when one, this is in the younger crowd, when one person says, I love you, bro, no homo. That's what they have to say to make themselves feel oh. safe, that they're not being homosexually attracted. That's where we're at right now. And that, that, that sucks. We can't just say, I love you, bro. I love you. So it starts with our circle. We need a bit of a man's empowerment for us to be balanced. And we're trying to work on it. It's too, too huge. Um, I was just going to say, um, yeah, OK, so the ideal is salvation, you know, to find spirit and somebody else, but perforce we have to interact in a material medium and being sex creatures, the sexual attraction energy is going to be a factor in it, in some form or another, right. modified, distorted by whatever we have viewed in our life. Um, but I think like one thing I try to think about is just the fact of eternal life, that no matter what you're feeling on a carnal, material level towards anyone in that moment, you're going to know them at a later iteration of life when sexuality is not a factor right. in the next life. Right. And so I guess that I, I try to allow just the novelty of being a sex creature for as short as we are, like to experience those feelings and whatever as being appropriate for this time, but to recognize that they are just this lifetime, and no matter how that gets worked out in this life, it doesn't affect one way or another the relationship potentials in the next life. I agree, and it's also nice to then actually have some knowledge of how to um, maneuver in that reality that, as you said, we're sexual creatures. How can I effectively maneuver in this? So that's kind of what I'm trying to share is some skills so that you can effectively maneuver in it. I know you have a question. Um, yeah, and uh, being married is effective too. You know, yeah, it is. It's like, yeah. doesn't, really, <laughs> doesn't really matter in it a is. sense. It, you know, it's kind of like, well, that's, it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's one thing if you're kind of like single and you're meeting people that are like your age and also single, then maybe it can be like a, a distraction from talking about spiritual yeah. things. But, but uh, that's, that's not... Or I guess th th that's a whole big can of worms, sort of what you bring up, this whole male-female thing, you know? Right. Like, yeah, a lot of people, have, yeah, in general, people kind of understand if you go to a Urantia conference and you, like, start dating random people because the attraction arises, um, you know, you're kind of like, it's kind of incestuous if you, if you kind of do that <laughs> repeatedly. Yeah. But, but it, is, it, it does also happen easily because yeah. people have this spiritual bond mm -hmm. or this, you know, they have so much in common that's very unusual. Um, but, but anyway, but that... It feels like, um, or what I was kind of, the main point that I wanted to get to was, I'm not really sure about, for me, um, you know, I, I often will maybe develop a rapport and, and become friends with people and so forth, but the actual step of, the salvation step, you know, like, I live in, well, even, but even in America, but like, wow, living in Sweden, it feels like there's such a, um, yeah, that's such a big step in a way. So for me, well, there is, of course, I can share with somebody that, um, when you know when you become friends with somebody and you think they would be open to, for example, studying the Urantia book together or something like that, then you know, like my wife, for example, she read the Urantia book because she was interested in me, and now you know we have that in common, and she sort of maybe got some salvation from that or whatever. Right. But but to, to, for me to just tell somebody, oh, find God within yourself, it doesn't feel like mm -hmm. that is going to lead to changing their life, or I don't know how to go about changing somebody's life by telling them well, to I think find God within themselves. Well, yeah, and you raise it bring up a good thing and that's the difference between it's just being this mechanical thing of me saying you know find God in your life versus you trust me you enough mm -hmm. from the storytelling that my you, you trust my experience and it's not just me telling you it's you wanting to do it. it's that other person wanting to do it and it's kind of like they've given themselves the permission to do it now because they have a partner in it. Mm -hmm. they lean on your feet she was first. Actually, he, he has. Okay, Marvin's been. Uh, just a couple of things. One, you know, when Jesus was talking, and when Jesus made that incredible move to establish the women's court, mm -hmm. they, they began to engage in ministries. And 
I think it's still true to this day that women can engage in ministries mm -hmm. with women that men just cannot mm -hmm. because of the ease and because of many women by men. So I think that's a relevant factor. <coughs> and we understand how we have <coughs> ministers and fishers of, of men and women, that women can do things with women and men can do things with men because they travel relatively free of some of the right. dynamics. Absolutely. So that's one thing. The other thing is, I was trying to answer your question for myself. When I've been engaged in talking with a woman, and I, I feel some dynamic that's like that, and it's a spiritual conversation that is interfering, what I find really powerful is I get really deep and connected mm -hmm. with the fact that this is a sister, mm -hmm. a spiritual sister. Mm -hmm. and. What if I were in a family and this was actually my sister, how would I be related right. to her? And when I feel that reality, I don't have, that's part of my difficulty is that you're sharing lots and lots of technique. I can't focus on the technique. If I focus on the reality, my sense is subliminal. I'm different than the whole interaction changes. It all, a lot of that stuff for me disappears. Yeah. Yeah. And when the inner reality is really integral, it just disappears and it just flows more easily. It takes a little while. Yeah. So I'm just saying something for the power of the interior reality playing itself out technique-wise in ways that are subliminal but we don't even are not even aware of. Yeah, and that's why I say, you know, it starts with the spirit and inward. And what you're what you just explained is that you went in and you let the spirit take care of the rest. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. But there's some people that they don't know how to do that. <coughs> you, you've been having a relationship with God for years. Some people yeah. they have to literally pretend to be like Jesus for a little while until they feel comfortable talking to God, right? Like, oh, how many times did the apostles say, uh, Jesus, when the kingdom comes, where am I going to sit? Right? And then these are apostles. We talk to them all the time. So they didn't always get it either. They had to, like, get coached along the way. And I'm not trying, like I said from the beginning, I'm not trying to take any uniqueness of spirit out of this. And I'm not saying to throw it all of it out the window and just go technical. But when you can actualize a bit of the technical... And enthuse it with the spirit, it's very potent. You know where you're standing in each moment, and then you know how you can serve at each moment. I'd just like to throw something in. And I was attracted to this topic because of our study group study this past uh, winter. I kept noticing that um, things like the apostles we have mentioned uh, were attracted to Jesus not because of his message, they couldn't understand his message. But they were attracted to certain personality uh, elements. Each was attracted to a different thing, actually. Right. Uh, and they kept falling around until they started understanding it. But they were following him because of his personal attractiveness and not because of his words for the longest time. They didn't know what he was talking about. Yeah. So I do believe that personal attractiveness is important here. I just don't know how to get it, but maybe I have a start on it. <laughs> Well, it's that self-work. I'm really telling you, the self-work is what reflects out. People can pick up, like, man, this guy took care of himself. He did the work. He, he went in a dark place that I haven't even gotten into yet. So he's got some knowledge that I want to listen to. So, uh, Derek, to reiterate, Garvin actually re kind of repeat, um, I became a minister, and once I get rapport and I know that I'm connected, I right away make it clear, I'm a married minister. <laughs> That's great, because it puts us on the level of, I'm here because I really care about you. I'm not interested in anything going on beyond this. It's a great way to be able to relate. Set the boundaries. Set the boundaries, exactly. Very clearly it sets the boundaries. And we're not all ministers, and we don't possibly want to um, aspire to be, but you can always come from the place of, I am an ambassador of Christ. And as an ambassador of Christ, like Marvin said, I really love you, but I'm not sexually attracted to you, nothing personal. And this is all happening unconsciously and, and even not directly communicated. I'm not interested in you, but like I shared with you last night, my husband was a, a professor and counselor for 22 years. I've been a lay counselor for almost two decades. What I find is relating to someone because they're a brother, sister, and spirit, that transference happens, they're attracted to you, you might be attracted to something in them, but what I find is taking that energy and then putting it back into, and I love you, and I want to be a, a, a connected spiritual being with you, and what can I do to help 
you right where you are. Now, I do grief work. So it's a great place for grief work because you're just focused on helping them maneuver through the awful place of grief. And really, that's often where they want to be. They're not thinking about sexual things. But if we can take that energy and that transference and turn it into um, energy of what more can I do that's really beneficial for you, it tends to break that um, sexual appeal. Yeah, they start getting it. That really you're just interested in their soul. You're just really interested in the person that they are, not the sexual being that I they are. I would agree, and, and I would say um, one recommendation is to kind of ground it in reality by saying, so if you just want to support someone like, I'm your biggest fan, for no reason, then yeah, it's, uh, it, it could be misconstrued. It's inauthentic, right. right. That would be inauthentic. But if it's like... Like for you, it's, it's, you saw my speech in at Pato's thing, and you're like, "Wow, that was impressive." I, I I'm supportive of you. How can I help you? Right. Then you're grounded. The same thing. You saw my value, you elicited it, and then you spoke to it. Okay. And that's what I'm trying to show is that your 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 attraction to the person you're ministering to needs to be grounded in something tangible. Otherwise, it will be misinterpreted as sexual attraction. Mm -hmm. If they're not a, a fellow brother in Christ and realize that we're all brothers and sisters, and yeah, I love you too, for no reason, I love you, right? Then they won't get that. They won't get that. If you're just like, I love you. Right. Like, <laughs> 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 you gotta be mindful. Yes. So I really appreciate your model here of attraction, comfort, and salvation. Um, and I would propose an additional model kind of in tangent with it, maybe, and it's coming from this perspective. Not everyone needs to be saved, but this model can be useful for just learning how to love people. And, you know, um, we, we, in the salvation part, is certainly when we can come in contact with, if we want to be there for them, if there's that need, but just learning to love them, and of course I'm not talking in a sexual way, but to me that's that can help lead to uh, the salvation. Absolutely. And I would almost use that model more. Yeah, I mean, instead of salvation, it could be loving, or yeah, loving I mean, connection. Love. Yeah. What's that? Healing. Healing. Whatever, whatever you want. I just want to put that, that the ultimate goal really is that we're helping people find that, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I think there's to say that in order uh, to love people, we have to, we have to know them. Yeah. In order to love divine things, we have to love them first. And this, this is what we do in learning to love. I mean, I, I can, I'm a very uh, social person. I like to engage in conversation. And uh, I will not speak, I will not talk about spiritual thing or God, mm -hmm. unless the person, you see, I see the, the person that he interested on that. Uh, other than that, I would just use whatever it is for us as humans to relate to each other. Love, just pure simple love, and, and let them know that you care about it. And then that will open other doors, you know. Mm -hmm. they, they, they will, salvation, like she said, is, 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 is personal, is, is, is that person want to be saved, whatever, she will let you know, but uh, until then, there's a relationship that you can build and love and trust, you know, and I think that's what, what is, uh, I know I once was told, how can you never take me to bed? I said, I just, I just love you too much. I said, no, I'm, not, I'm not interested in that. that whatever I feel for you, does not, does not allow me to think about you in other, in other levels. Right, right. I just, I just, I said, oh, come to away, Teresa, look at Teresa. I said, she, she's my co-worker. But, but oh, look at him. I said, I just love her so much that I just don't feel anything else but respect. Yeah. Yeah, and you're seeing, you're seeing the limitation of love to some people. Some people think that's the highest expression of love. Mm -hmm. Is this romantic love? And you're obviously displaying even higher. This one, yeah. Right? To, to another level. And, and, but what I'm trying to say is that, yes, the goal is to just be there for someone, give them the space to find themselves in, in unconditional love. Mm -hmm. I say unconditional love is the soil that nurtures and cultivates the seed of empathy in all of us. Okay? So it's very important. But what I'm trying to do is give you a couple of techniques 
so that you can get yourself in the position to get them on the issue. Okay. So one of those things is this concept of proximity. Okay. And let me mention this. Yes. My son actually is going to a seminar about how to connect prayer. Okay, so he can turn that into how I know, to but I said, son, you told, if you lift the weights and everything, you're already attracted. Oh, no, but I don't know how to pick up her. <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. Now let me tell you why, because he's willing to do the self-work to change. Yeah, but I'm you know, pretty he, happy to be here, so I can tell him the other. Yeah, the other, yeah, the right on. Okay. Right on, give me your email, I'll send you this. Okay. Yes, sir. But you were going to talk I about... This isn't about, you know, what you're talking about, the men and women, but you said that some men don't have groups. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Walk to Emmaus, but our men have little groups of six to seven people that...